everybody and welcome back to my channel if you're new here welcome i'm amber rose also known as the religious hippie you can basically follow me on any social media platform or you can go straight to my website at the so as you guys can tell by the title today is going to be a very fun live stream because first of all halloween is literally in a couple days so exciting but there are so many misconceptions surrounding halloween so i really wanted to put the truth out there and to do that i brought out the big guns so welcome joe heschmeyer to uh this live stream I am so excited to get into this show. Thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I am so excited as well. And people are going to start kind of piling in as we go about this. James and Gabby and everybody, welcome. So, Joe, we're going to kind of just jump right in here. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people have issues with these days is that they think that Halloween came from a pagan holiday, yeah. um, a pagan holiday that I can never pronounce for some reason, no matter how many times I try. <laughs> it it looks like Sam Hain, but it's pronounced like Samhain. Sometimes you'll hear Samhain, but yes. Samhain seems to be the, like the people who I trust the most on this say Samhain. And there is such a, a date on the calendar called Samhain. It oh, just wow. means summer's end. And people have turned, you know, if if you were to like find a modern, like say a 2024 calendar and you'd find like, oh, first day of fall or, you know, last day of summer, something like that. That's Samhain. And it's not um, any of the things you may have heard about it. You know, like one of the major kind of stories you'll hear is, oh, this was a, this Celtic uh, religious festival. Yes. And the the whole idea of a, Celtic religious festival that crosses all the different groups of Celts uh, doesn't really work on the face of it. So for those who don't know, the Celts were a group of people who were in Central Europe uh, about 2,500 years ago, and then they were dispersed. And so they kind of went in two directions. The ones who went east, uh, many of them became, you know, Romans and practiced Roman paganism. And a lot of those became Christian as well uh, in modern day Turkey. Like when St. Paul is writing the Galatians, those are a Celtic people, uh, but they are obviously not practicing some Druidic, pagan, Samhain type festival. Uh, and then you have the Western Celts who go to like the British Isles, so Ireland, but also Scotland, Wales, England, uh, Northwest uh, France, and then Northwest Spain, the area called Galicia. So... I mentioned this to say that among the Celtic people, there's at least six major languages. And, you know, like that's just the Western Celts, not even looking oh. at the Eastern ones. The <laughs> idea, and by the way, they're, they're not, um, they're not literate. Oh. Meaning like Christianity, literacy, and the Roman calendar all kind of arrive at the same time. Now there are some Celts, like the Gauls, who, who modern day France, uh, who would write in, in uh, like Greek, but, they didn't have their own written language. So I mentioned this because if you're trying to say all of these different people, despite speaking different languages and not having the same calendar, all celebrated this pagan holiday on the same day, you're handicapped by the fact that like none of that sounds plausible. And like, if you just said like, oh, all Asians celebrate like May 13th as their new year, I'd be like, I don't believe that's real <laughs> like for no. a lot of reasons right they don't have the same calendar system they don't speak the same language they don't have the same culture so this idea of a pan-celtic religious festival you'll find it in some older historical literature but it has a very weak evidentiary basis the closest thing you're going to find to anything like Samhain related is all irish mm -hmm. and so even in like wales which is just across that, that little strip of water from ireland uh you only find Samhain being celebrated in places that have Irish migration. So, you know, this was an important civic day among some of the Irish Celts, but it, it wasn't like some pan Celtic thing. And then that's just Samhain in general. Now, some people are going to say, well, okay, whether it's Irish Celts or all Celts, well, that's only the tip of the iceberg because the idea that there are these religious rites and here's what they were and there were bonfires and they're driving away demons or the dead were walking among them or any of these other things. Remember the whole thing about them not being literate. So historians don't actually have any evidence of any of that stuff. So people are just projecting that stuff onto the past and, and basically guessing what they imagine uh, a Samhain festival looked like. And there's literally no evidence 
of any particular religious customs or festivals happening on that day. We know people got together and they celebrated the end of the year because if you're in an agrarian society, hey, we're done with the harvest for the year. That's great. Let's get Celebrate. together. And, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like the end of the school year if you're a student. You know, like, you know what that is. Now, could people celebrate in an inappropriate way? Of course. Does that automatically make it, you know, a pagan ritual, blah, blah, blah? No, of course not. Yeah. Uh, I definitely think, too, when uh, I don't exactly remember where I necessarily heard this, if it's true or not, but I heard that it really started taking off in the 1600s from a priest who wasn't very knowledgeable about the faith and Protestants ended up taking what he was saying and running with it. And that's why we have this whole idea of where, you know, Druids and and stuff mm -hmm. kind of go into Halloween. And reality is that it was made to be anti-Catholic propaganda. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's a, there's a good deal of accuracy to that. Um, uh, Jeffrey King, I believe is his name, is 17th yeah. century uh, yeah, he was a Catholic priest and he was uh, really into Irish history, but he was not a very good historian. And so historians today give very little weight to anything he said, because r regularly we'll hear some story about, oh, yeah, this is like this ancient Irish thing. And when you trace the evidence, it goes exactly back to him and nobody before him. And when you find that happening on more than one thing, you're like, maybe this person made things up or like maybe they just like shared rumors that they didn't have any good basis for. Because we literally don't have any evidence before him for a lot of this Salwin stuff. And it's like, unless he has some treasure trove of documents that he never mentioned and we don't know about, uh, there's just no evidence. And, and we do have evidence from much before him. So we have like 12th century medieval Irish stories that uh, tell tales that are set at Samhain time, but they don't mention any religious festivals, any of these things. So the stuff that Jeffrey King will later uh, claim about it for hundreds of years before him, we see descriptions of Samhain that have no reference to that. Mm. So he doesn't seem to be someone in a position to know, you know, what, like if, if someone asked you, like whatever city you're in, what was it like in that place 500 years ago? Chances are you don't know very accurately. And, and it's not any different if you're in Ireland as opposed to the US or, or anywhere else. Like you're still dealing with a really ancient history. You might imagine it looked very much like what you, you live today, or you might imagine some really exotic pagan thing, but it, either way, you're just inventing kind of a mental picture and, and then sharing that if, as if it's true. It's so interesting to me how misinformation from literally thousands of years ago, hundreds of years <laughs> ago, whatever, is still being spread around and nobody wants to do the actual research to go back and see if any of this is accurate. And then Catholics get blamed for it. Yeah, there's uh, something called the Black Legend. And uh, this is kind of an anti-Catholic strain in English-speaking literature and history and everything else. Uh, it's complicated because part of it is religious because you have, you know, the world's most populous Protestant countries, the U.S. and the U.K., uh, writing a lot of history that's often implicitly or even overtly anti-Catholic. Like the Catholic Church is often the villain in the story. But you also have a lot of political stuff that for centuries... Uh, the biggest rival to England was Spain. And so a lot of the stories you've heard from, you know, from the Spanish Inquisition to medieval torture devices to fill in the blank, it's basically government propaganda that we now know isn't true. And so in a case like Samhain, it was really easy uh, to kind of seize upon it in the 19th century and early 20th century to say, look at how Christianity just co-opted paganism and pagans were really happy to hear that, of course. Um, a lot of the people who are most influential in popularizing the Samhain theory were the people who basically invented the religion of Wicca. So, I mean, it it is a, an attempt to turn Wicca from an obvious 20th century cosplay into something that can claim to have some kind of historical roots. Like, oh, we're actually just rediscovering this history. It's like, no, no, you're literally just making it up because you don't have a written history. Um, but then the other group that, that really seized upon it was American evangelicals, because it was like, look, this is a dangerous holiday and watch out. And I mean, I get people being uneasy about some of the raucousness of Halloween. I, I get that. Uh, I mean, I can understand having some discomfort about the raucousness of a Friday night, but it doesn't True. immediately invalidate Friday night or Halloween. It just says, well, how do you approach times of festivity? Right. And I definitely think 
you know, it's not just Halloween that society has twisted. I mean, there's Easter, there's Christmas, right. there's all of St. Patrick's Day is no longer yes. it's Patty's Day or Valentine's Day is St. Valentine's Day to us. And it's interesting to see how people will take these things and be like, oh, Christmas is pagan. Easter is pagan. And I'm like, can we just stop, please? <laughs> yeah, it, it's like every holiday people claim it's pagan. And it's like, look, if. I mean, first of all, is it really hard to believe that Christians might want to celebrate the fact that their Messiah rose from the dead? Like, is that you You have to jump to? Well, maybe they were getting this from Astra, this pagan goddess who may or may not have existed in the British Isles, nowhere near Israel, nowhere near Rome. And this is, I mean, another dimension to all of this. Um, even if you think Samhain had pagan festivities, like religious festivities, which we, again, don't know of any, let's assume they exist. What does that have to do with the holiday of All Saints Eve? Like All Hallows Eve, which is what Halloween means and is, doesn't come from Ireland mm -hmm. and wasn't on the calendar on October 31st, even when they had All Saints Day in Ireland. It comes to Ireland on November 1st slash October 31st uh, from Germany to Rome and then to the Universal Calendar. And so like this was, Samhain has nothing to do with that story. Now, the best you can say is, well, look, people were used to celebrating at the end of the harvest season. And so now they're going to celebrate at Halloween time. But a lot of the stuff that spooks people out about Halloween in the first place isn't coming from Samhain. It's just coming from Catholics remembering that the dead exist. So we have, you know, these back-to-back -back holidays of All Saints Day where we uh, pray to the saints in heaven and commemorate their great witness and sacrifice. And then All Souls Day where we pray for the suffering souls in purgatory. And it's natural, I think, at the, you know, kind of the close of the year as everything around you is dying. And you have these two holidays that very much have death in view for one's mind to turn to thoughts of death. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, at least it's not inherently a bad thing. It can be a really good thing. You know, as the book of Sirach says, remember the last days and you or remember the last things and you'll never sin. That if you remember death, judgment, heaven, and hell, the so-called four last things, this was a way that Catholics have long uh, practiced kind of moral theology, really. Because like, St. Thomas More has, has a book on the four last things. And the idea is if you know that you're going to die and stand before God, uh, you're going to approach your neighbor differently. You're going to approach your day differently. You're going to live a different life than if you think you're going to live forever. Absolutely. I know I, re I remember reading, um, I think it was St. Alphonsus Liguori's Meditations on Death. And it like, I was like, oh, this is hard. Man. This is hardcore. <laughs> but around this time, I mean, first of all, memento mori, remember your death. Mm -hmm. It's like, we will all die one day. And so it's important for us that we're always prepared for that because we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. Um, and so to consistently keep that at the forefront of our minds, not to be afraid of it, right. but to simply remind ourselves that, you know, the world is our ship, not our home, as St. Therese of Lisieux used to say. Right, and yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say very much so. I mean, we want to be mindful both of the reality of death and the reality that you know, as St. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that we need to be sober and watchful because our opponent, the devil, uh, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't that doesn't mean you have to be like cowering in fear, but it means that you take seriously uh, both death and the spiritual realm, uh, both in the good and the bad sense of that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that is a healthy view where, you, where you're not just thinking uh, what I see is all there is. Because exactly. that's not true either right now or of my destiny. Exactly. And I think, too, a lot of the times going back to our hollow tide Halloween thing, there are all these other holidays that kind of get wrapped up into it, like the Days of the Dead. I think that's yeah. a Mexican tradition. And is that that is not in accordance with Catholic teaching, correct? Day of the Dead is uh, another fake tradition. I, I know that sounds like bad to say. <laughs> but there's no evidence of it um, actually existing before the 20th century. And the fact that it's on All Souls Day uh, points to the, like, it was created in Mexico um, under Cardenas, I think President Cardenas, who is, like, pretty anti-Catholic. And so it was an attempt to create.
create kind of a counter to Christianity. Now, and so it's like it's a fake Mexican holiday. Like it is uh, Aztec Kwanzaa. You know, like mm-hmm. it's just a, a fake 20th century thing that pretends to be much older, which is exactly what Wicca is, by the way. I mean, yeah. it, that's just British or Irish uh, Kwanzaa. You know, it's just like this fake tradition where you say, OK, but I know this started in the 20th century. So how are you telling me it's 2000 years old? It's very interesting to me how these the anti-Catholic propaganda also takes aspects of Catholicism and tries to twist it. Yeah. And I'm just like. I mean, yes, it, it, I think the main thing is, is that it confuses people and yeah. that's what they want because if people are confused, they're more easily deceived. Yeah. I mean, you find this, I, I know I sound like a conspiracy now, but you find this thing because like all the best holidays are from Christianity. Yeah. And exactly. so there is an anti uh, Christian, anti Catholic kind of move. And there's two things you can do. One thing you can do is try to create new holidays. So you get like the communists create May Day. And then in the U.S., they make Labor Day. And these holidays are lame. And nobody is like, I'm getting all my Labor Day clothes together. And, you know, (laughs) no, that's not a thing. And so, like, those things exist, but they're not super successful. The other thing they do is they tear down the holidays that do exist. So they tell you that it's actually sinful for you to celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas. It's sinful to celebrate Jesus' resurrection on Easter. And it's like, why in the world would any of that be sinful? And the allegation is, well, pagans, once upon a time, did the same thing. Now, there's two things that should be noticed there. Number one, even if that were true, who cares? True. Like, I believe Jesus died on Friday. I also believe that the word Friday is originally uh, in honor of a Norse god. That's okay. I'm not threatened by that. I don't have to, like change it from Friday to some other name. You know, like I can use all this stuff that we get that is an actual pagan inheritance there. It doesn't matter. But as a matter of fact, this stuff isn't of pagan origin. Mm -hmm. You know, like only in the vaguest sense of, oh, pagans ate meals. Pagans had parties sometimes. And it's like, yeah, yeah, everybody did. So if by pagan, you just mean like human experience. Right, exactly. Uh, there can be this kind of paranoia. And I would I would say to that, and I mean quite literally like a kind of paranoia. Like think about the way St. Paul talks about eating meat sacrificed to idols when he's talking to the Corinthians. He's way more relaxed about it uh, than Christians are today about the idea that the meat they're eating might have been sacrificed to pagan idols, even though it wasn't. True. Like there, he's he's dealing with cases where people actually are eating meat bought in places in Corinth where there's a decent chance demonic rituals are being done involving that food. And he's still taking a, yeah, don't sweat it kind of attitude about it. As long as nobody thinks that you're cool with the pagan part. And so likewise, I would just say, even if you think, despite all the evidence, even if you think that all of these Christian holidays are really pagan holidays, then what does that matter to you? As long as people don't think, you know, Having a Christmas tree in your home doesn't mean you worship wood. It does. You'll find these very strange kind of arguments. And it's like, apply that to anything else in Christianity. Mm-hmm. Well, again, like pagans drive cars. You drive cars. Does that mean you're a pagan? No, it doesn't. Like you can have two people that both like the same thing. So I find the whole thing very strange. Well, stranger still, if, if I can <laughs> just completely be on a soapbox here, <laughs> you'll find in some Protestant churches that they won't celebrate halloween because they think it's pagan and so they'll have a harvest fest instead of you encountered this or are you familiar with yes i dated an evangelical for a few years and um he was very (laughs) anti-halloween and i was like yeah so the thing that's hilarious about it is that's what Samhain was it was a harvest fest so in trying to avoid the pagan thing you ended up doing the actual thing the pagans were doing and it's like yeah this is the (laughs) Uh, harvest fest to avoid celebrating anything that looks too much like a harvest fest, huh? And, and it's even weirder because most of the people doing it don't harvest, so it ends up just looking way more like Samhain than Halloween looks like Samhain. That's all I'd say. Not that yeah. there's anything wrong with that, but it doesn't make it automatically pagan, and so it's a very strange kind of place to find oneself. 
Yeah, I always noticed that too, because to me, I was like, well, so what if we converted a pagan holiday to a Christian one? If that was accurate and if that is true, so right. what? Like, what's wrong with that? You know, I mean, we adopted halos from the Greek, you know, when <laughs> right. we put halo, you know, like obviously we changed it a little bit. Well, no, I mean, even a lot of the biblical language. So even like calling God Lord, well, Baal is called Lord. That's what his name means. Oh. So the fact that you use the theological language and vocabulary, both in the literal sense of the words, but also in like the imagery and descriptions, as long as you're not compromising anything in Christianity, the mere fact that you're finding words similar to the words somebody else uses, you know, a Jupiter is from Deus Pater, God the Father. We also call God the Father. And Caesar called himself Son of God. And so the Gospel of Mark opens up by by declaring this is the evangelion like this is the good news and mm -hmm. this is what you would declare if you were caesar and you were announcing some great military victory but so it's it's put in this way it's intentionally copying mocking the kind of roman emperor sort of style and showing that christ is the true king but notice in that it's being presented as this very clear kind of parallel to contrast with uh paganism and like, if Jesus does that, and that's okay, then why are so many Christians worried about doing the same thing? Yeah, I believe it comes from like this deep root of just like scrupulosity and, and in a way pride, because scrupulosity is pride in a way of wanting to be, I mean, there's so many arguments. I want to be set apart from the world. I don't want to be this. And you can't do that because if you do that, it's association with this. And it's just like all of these stones being thrown between Catholics. And it's like, can we just take a breather here for a second? Yeah, it it's really difficult when it's like it becomes a sort of uh, Puritanism isn't exactly the word. But, you know, that's that sort of thing. And you can become a Pharisee with it if you're not careful. And so by all means, like, I don't want to knock somebody who says, I don't want my kids dressing up as demons for Halloween. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, you know, totally. That's that's great. Uh, there, there are things that people do uh, on Halloween that are gross, and they're, you know, celebrating evil. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You know what I mean? Like, there, there's a medium. There's a middle place where you just like throw out the baby with the bathwater, or, uh, you know, take the take the evil stuff with the good. You can just say like, okay, well, what what is worth celebrating here, and then celebrate in that way. And it doesn't. In, and I've heard some Catholics say like, okay, great, but we're only going to be saints. And that, you can do that if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to knock it. But it is also okay for like kids to play dress up and be Disney princesses. Yeah, They're, that's not wicked. That's not evil. And if you think that's the moral battle you need to be fighting in this day and age. I'm worried about that because I think there are much bigger and more serious fights that are actual black and white, good and evil sort of fights. And, you know, my daughter wants to be Snow White. If I said, like, oh, you can't be Snow White, like, why? Why not? not? Like, so, so yeah. But uh, having said that, if you want to dress up as a saint, that's, that's fine too. Yeah. I think also when it comes down to that, I feel like if you're a parent and you're afraid of your child becoming pagan or having these pagan ideas because they want to be a pumpkin for Halloween, maybe you should rethink about the foundation of Catholicism you're giving them. <laughs> like... Right, right. And I actually think more damage is being done in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, I hate the Billy Joel song, Only the Good Die Young. But there's this line where he says he'd rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints because the sinners have much more fun. And I just think like we don't want to unnecessarily feed into that. And I'm not saying you have to like do things you're morally uncomfortable with so you can seem cool to anti-religious people. <laughs> but I do think, especially in the family context, if you quash out um, natural sources of human joy and celebration and all of this, uh, that's actually doing some real damage. And I, I think... So Joseph Pieper, the German philosopher from the last century, uh, in his book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, makes the point that culture is rooted in cultus. I believe it's Pieper who makes that point. I think John Sr. also makes that point. Um, but it's this idea that a healthy culture with holidays, even that word is coming from holy days. Like this is coming from this deeply Catholic sense of the world. And so like the Catholic liturgical calendar had a lot of opportunities to celebrate. Mm. And 
a lot of the things they were doing were just fun. And so especially if you're a Catholic and you're inclined to this sort of fear of secular joy, I would say watch out for that. Um, yes. By all means, don't buy into like wicked pleasure. Yeah. But secular joy isn't automatically wicked pleasure. There's a there's a great line in I want to say the like history of the cathedral in Chartres. It somewhere one of the French churches. There was a controversy over a ball game that they were playing in the church labyrinth on Easter. Okay. And <laughs> so the question was like, are they being too irreverent on church grounds playing this ball game? And it's like, okay, those are people just having fun. Like they're not claiming like, oh, Jesus really wants us to play this ball game here on the church grounds. This is just a healthy, normal celebration. It's like playing kickball, right? Like you just, you get a bunch of people together and games are going to break out if you let them. Hmm. And so I, I mentioned that just to say that that's healthy and human and something that God created us for. And so stripping us down uh, from that is really a sort of assault on, on our humanity in a way that is actually unchristian because authentic Christianity is rooted in an authentic anthropology. And so if you're not letting people be fully human, whether it's getting rid of their emotions or getting rid of their, their joyfulness and celebration and all of this, there's something that's really um, denuded about that in a really unhealthy way that, that just, we can do better. I also think it really pushes them further away from the church because yes. then it kind of solidifies in their minds this idea that the church is rigid and it has, you can't break the rules and like, there's no fun in the church type yeah. of idea. Right. Because people are going to have that natural desire to be able to just relax and have fun. Yeah. And if you've taught them, you can't do that and be Christian, then they'll believe you and they won't be Christian. Exactly. And it's like, there is a joy. And I think it comes with meeting people where they are, but like we were saying with children, children don't know any better, but if they're, taught that certain things that genuinely are not evil are evil in a way or their parents make it a bigger deal than it needs to be they become either super scrupulous themselves or they end up falling away from the faith because there's no fun in the church yeah right we should be very careful not to bind what the church has loosed or loose what the church has bound and i think different personality types gravitate towards one or the other like, you don't want to take an attitude that's really permissive of things that the church is warned against. But you also don't want to take an attitude that that treats everything as really uh, evil or dangerous or wicked uh, when the church hasn't spoken on it. And you can find, unfortunately, you can find priests even uh, and exorcists who will lean into all these fears like, oh, if you read Harry Potter or if you celebrate Halloween or you do any of these things, that's going to invite demons. And it's like, that is such unhelpful and in spiritually unhealthy uh, mm -hmm. counsel to give, uh, especially when, so I, I saw recently an article where a group of exorcists, exorcists came out and, and said all this stuff about Samhain that I just said like a week earlier in this video wasn't yeah. true. And so it's just this like, oh, okay, well, the call is coming from inside the house. I'm used to handling this stuff from Protestants and here's Catholics saying the same thing. And it's not true and it's not healthy. And mm -hmm. I, I mentioned this because like one of the first fights the church has is the fight with the so-called Judaizers. And they're telling uh, adult male converts they have to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. And it wasn't just like, well, just to be on the safe side. No, like this was actually doing evangelical harm. Right. Telling people they have to follow a bunch of things they don't actually have to follow is not a harmless error. And if you don't have uh, the authority to say that, it's just your own personal interpretation, don't do that. Don't do that to other people. Don't even do that to your own kids. If you can avoid it, like just don't give the impression that Christianity has more rules and obligations and all of that than it really has because that does turn people off to it. And it's also just not true. Yeah. I know a lot of people I grew up with when I was younger, they, as teenagers, they weren't allowed to watch Harry Potter. They weren't allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons. They weren't allowed to do a whole lot of things. And now 
most of them, if yeah. I look them up online, are now Wiccans. They do witchcraft. They've fallen away from the church. They completely went in the opposite direction. And right. If you tell people yeah. paganism is fun and fun is paganism, yep. uh, yeah, that is a great advertisement for paganism. And it's crazy because to me, I'm like, I would rather expose my children to these things because they're going to experience it one day, but give them the Catholic perspective of it and be like, yeah, okay, these things happen. But, you know, as Catholics, we obviously believe that magic is bad. There's no such thing as white magic, but it's not, you know, it's, it's more harm to call something evil or bad or this or that. And then your child go and seek it out on their own and right. get like the whirlwind of the world just sweeps them up because there's so much information and paganism's pushed so hard in yeah. today's society and just occultism in general um, that they'll just get swept, you know, swept up if they don't have a good Catholic foundation and not just like, oh, we just, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. Right. Instead of actually telling them we don't do that because, or this is why this is bad, but this is make believe, you know, right really drawing those lines, but still allowing them to explore the world around them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's very well said. And I think the thing you said at the very start about how the parents who were overly restrictive, the kids rebelled and like became pagans. Mm -hmm. I've, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I've, I've found very much the same thing. I, I think if I were to put it very broadly among like Catholic parents who are, you know, really trying to not like we show up, every now and then on Sunday, but like really like the, the bot end Catholic parents I'd say there's kind of two camps. There's a group that wants to protect their kids and the group that wants to equip their kids. And the first way doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it especially didn't work. Yeah. Like I was born in 85. So like the internet happened. <laughs> and, Just happened. I mean, it, it kind of existed before, but it was boring. <laughs> And and so like I was ten when uh, Windows ninety five came out and AOL was a big thing and like the the dawn of the internet age, in the real like in your home everybody's got the internet, age happened there, and so my point is like you just can't like you couldn't in nineteen eighty five although they didn't know it at the time and you certainly can't now, uh, create a culture in which you can just protect people from all the evil and malice and wickedness and temptation and everything else. What you can do is equip them. So I was thinking about this recently because I mean, in the secular world, you have this same fight about um, physical illness and injury and disease. So you have parents who want to make sure their kids never get hurt. Mm -hmm. And this is disastrous as a parenting strategy. This is like one of the worst things you can do. And I, I know that sounds hyperbolic, but it, it literally is. Um, I'm a big fan of the book, The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukasov. And they make this point that like keeping kids away from peanuts because of peanut allergies in the US has led to a tenfold increase in peanut allergies compared to places like Israel, where you're exposed to peanuts uh, at a young age. And like they have a little treat called Bamba, which is like, imagine like a puffy Cheeto, but instead of cheese, it's peanut butter. Delicious. They're delicious, by the way. Yeah. Trader Joe's has some chocolate covered ones because, of course, we had to put chocolate on them. I need. But <laughs> don't get me wrong. They're very good. <laughs> uh, but like we purposely exposed our kids to Bomba from an early age to make sure they didn't develop a bunch of allergies and everything else because allergies and everything are on the rise and all sorts of things. But the idea there was that you have things that are fragile. You drop them and they break. You have things that are non-fragile. You drop them and they're fine. But then their argument was humans are actually anti-fragile, meaning we need to be dropped sometimes. We need to actually have some uh, struggles for our own growth. If you were like, I'm worried about breaking my leg, so I'm going to just sit in bed for the next six months, you would destroy your legs. Like they would be atrophied to the point you would no longer be able to walk. Meaning like you actually, as a biological organism, need some sort of encounter and struggle. Now it needs to be, you know, the right size. You don't want it to be like, I fell off a 20 foot tower, you know, like not, not that, <laughs> but like something in between staying in bed and like falling out of a tree somewhere in, in there, you've got like the right level of exercise, walking around that sort of thing. And it, and it's really good for your body and it hurts at the time. There's a struggle with it. It's not pleasant, but it's really good for you. Well, spiritually, mm -hmm. the same thing is true. We aren't meant to live in a bubble 
in terms of disease, but we're also not meant to live in a bubble in terms of uh, spirituality. And if you're in a bubble where you're not exposed to any pathogens, whether it's disease or any kind of evils, the first thing that comes through is going to wipe you out. And, and I think that's exactly kind of what you're seeing when you see the parents who are overly restrictive and they're, they're forbidding even things that don't need to be forbidden and they're not equipping their kids. They're just trying to shelter them. Mm -hmm. It's not a winning strategy in the long term. I definitely think most parents who parent that way parent out of fear. I feel like that is very fear driven parenting. I've never once met a parent who was a helicopter parent or super, you know, super into like protecting their child and like shielding them from everything who wasn't doing it out of fear. And, you know, we know that, you know, God is not a God of fear in that sense. It's, you know, we're God fearing people, but not like that. And um, Satan really likes to scare us, you know, into things. And yeah. if he can kind of use the world as being like, look how bad the world is. Do you really right. want little Timmy to like, you know, go through these horrible things? Little Timmy has to go through hard things. Otherwise, hard things are going <laughs> yeah. to go through little Timmy. OK, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, the beginning of this book says, don't prepare the road for your child. Prepare your child for the road. Yes. And I think that's good spiritual advice. Like, mm -hmm. that, you know, um, someone in the comments said kids need to eat dirt. Yes, exactly. Yes. Like it is it is so tempting as a parent. Because it's so hard when kids, like I've got um, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. Oh. And so there's injuries in the household every day. I mean, it's just like three, two of the three are, are boys and they manage to hurt themselves a lot. And it's hard as a parent. I think it's even harder for my wife. So it's one of those things you have to kind of catch like, okay, yes, this is difficult right now, but this can be a really good growth opportunity. And then they, this can help equip them, uh, even though it's unpleasant. It would be easier to just keep them from making mistakes, keep them from falling down, keep them from doing any of those things and just completely helicopter them. And as you say, that's fear-based. That's not trustful. God didn't give you a free will and he didn't give your children free will and an intellect and these desires just for those all to be quashed. That doesn't make sense. Like, why did he give these gifts if he didn't want them to be used? Exactly. And I mean, especially with children they need to explore they need to experience and if they're consistently reliant on their parents what happens if you're not there one day right you know what happens because you're not going to be around forever and you never know what might happen you might be gone sooner than you expect you might be gone longer than you expect but do you really want your child to be 40 years old and coming to you and being like hey mom um i don't know how to do laundry <laughs> you know right. what i mean yeah, no, totally. Helicopter parents mean boomerang kids where they just yeah. end up back in the home they, they left. There's a, I haven't read it yet. I've read the first paragraphs, but I didn't want to pay for the article. But the Wall Street Journal just had a piece on uh, how many parents are struggling with their kids going to college oh. because they've been monitoring everything that they do. And now they're in college and they have no, uh, you know, they, they in some cases they're going to see them at Thanksgiving. Right. And so that is a huge shift from daily 24 seven knowing where they are and what they're doing to not. And then look, I'm, in fairness, that's hard for anybody, even if you're parenting well, but if you're over parenting and you're making it too much about you and too much about fear and control, uh, then you, you're really going to be in a, in a very stressful situation. I know this is like on the surface, kind of far afield from the, the topic of Halloween, but I don't think they're that far removed because I think there's a pretty clear through line between the people who say like, Halloween is evil and dangerous because something could go wrong or someone could celebrate it badly. Uh, and then people who say that about, you know, every, every other thing that their kids could possibly get into. True. And I think especially because Halloween is one of the, it's one of the most demonized holidays in society <laughs> yes. <laughs> that that is the one that most parents are first of all going to be terrified of their children experiencing because there's like a whole bunch of reasons on one side and the non-Catholic side of it where they're like actually secular and they're like, oh, I don't really care, but they're crunchy moms. And they're like, my kids can eat so much red 40 and they're going to have like teeth rot and like da 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 da. Oh, yeah. There's that side of fear. And yep. then there's the fear of my child's going to become a witch. She's only one, but right. like she's already on her way because she wanted to be a cat for Halloween and a black <laughs> cat nonetheless. And it's like all of this, like, why are you projecting all of this fear yeah. onto your children? Yeah. 
I, I mean, <laughs> this is incredibly close to home because let's just say we're very crunchy adjacent. I'm obviously Me not too. very crunchy, <laughs> but, uh, and I think my wife has been very good about being discerning about like, what are things to actually be mindful of? And what are things that are just these excessive fears? And, and one of the things that's very, very true is there is a ton of fear mongering in these spaces with people who don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's true, whether you're talking about food dyes or whether you're talking about uh, spirituality and it's people who you know they're very confident and they'll tell you all these scary things but if you say like okay but what's the actual like evidence what, what are we going to find here it's often completely lacking and and so that's what i would urge you to do like what i've tried to do here at the halloween thing is to just say okay cool like what real evidence do we have that Samhain is this pagan you know demonic or uh, otherwise religious festival and and the, the answer turned out to be basically nothing mm, yep exactly and i mean while we're we're going to do a q a in a little bit here so people can start uh you know kind of putting their questions in the chat as we kind of you know wrap this up but as we go through and and we talk about some of these things about halloween one of the main things people always ask me is like where do we get all these traditions from then you know and i'm always just like well all over the world really but they all start usually with works of charity and things like <laughs> yeah. that <laughs> yeah i mean some of so a lot of like what we do with like trick-or-treating and stuff is coming from american kids and then before that from like Irish kids. Yeah. And some of those were good and some of those are bad traditions. I mean, I'll give you an example is like probably not a good one. Um, in like Michigan, you have what's called mischief night on October 30th. So the night before Halloween oh. <laughs> and you just like TP and egg houses and things. I wouldn't do that. That's not coming from like demons. That's not coming from paganism. It's just kids being punks. Yeah. And kids a hundred years ago being punks there's these hilarious stories about them like stealing gates on halloween like you know you've got a white picket fence and then you go out and your fence is completely gone because some kids work together to just steal. Why? just <laughs> just for the fun just for the prank Honestly, and that's, that's really funny <laughs> there's there's no need to look up demons there there's no gate stealing demon a lot of this stuff is just what are fun things to do in the fall slash what are some kids going to do if they have too much time on their hand? Because they're not working in the fields now because True. now they suddenly have a lot of uh, free time. And some of the stuff they get into is mischief. Fine. But we don't have to jump from mischief to like demons. Right. I mean, there are definitely like, you know, don't play with Ouija boards. Don't right, do tarot right. cards. Uh, the, the Halloween is not an excuse to participate in the occult for Catholics. But, you know, the harmless fun like trick-or-treating, carving yeah, jack-o'-lanterns, exactly. all of that stuff is really, really fun. I mean, didn't trick-or-treating come from in England to an extent where they used to give out soul cakes to the hungry? There, yeah, so there were soul – exactly. Uh, well done. Uh, I know it's in the British Isles. I don't actually know if it was England or not. But I know, like, the notion of soul cakes and basically asking charity is mm. – yeah. And, again, a very distinctly Catholic kind of tradition – there was also a tradition of doing bonfires, uh, but this was from the 16th century because, you know, as Catholics, we normally light candles in church. But when that was outlawed, they would just be like, fine, <laughs> we'll just build a bonfire outside. Fine the fire. Of the <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Instead of doing a little tiny candle, we'll do a giant bonfire. And then they we'll always tried to outside. they always tried to snuff us out, but we always came back. Stronger. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. But again, it's not coming uh, from paganism these are all these like catholic things now I, I guess i should say this like this is very much a irish anglo american sort of thing if you were to like go to spain or italy or poland or somewhere uh, you're not going to find halloween being a big thing but again that's just because different places celebrate different ways uh, right. i've got a brother who lives in spain and they have a giant midsummer festival uh, for the feast of saint james and they build like bonfires on the beach and all this and it's great fun and it's again it's like there are these times of the year that are seasonally really important for things like the climate and you know like your local climate maybe it feels really great in the middle of the summer and you want to go to the beach and build a bonfire and celebrate an apostles feast day wonderful great or you know it's the middle of winter and you need to pick me up and so you you really get into 
either Christmas or something else in the winter. Those are totally normal kind of human adaptations uh, to find a reason to celebrate. Like we just had um, a Saints Day party for the Feast of St. John Paul II. Oh, um, awesome. It was great. We picked like a saint out of a jar for the year to come. And then we drank cider and ate cookies. That was all. Like we completely made up the tradition. And it. we might do it next year. And hopefully we'll kind of do it for years to come. And it's just because like cider is fun. Cookies are great. And then choosing a saint and asking them to pray for you for the year to come is spiritually beneficial. So like why in the world not? And then you get to hang out with friends. That's where like authentic traditions can come from. It, it's organic and it's coming kind of from the ground up. So that's what we're dealing with. Like if you're from a culture and you're at a place where Halloween isn't a big deal, you're not like sinning by not doing it. But don't fall for the idea that you're not allowed to because it's it's of evil origin. And, and as you say, the, the two caveats are avoid anything that is actually a cult. Like avoid anything that actually is playing with demonic forces. And then I would also add to that, like avoid uh, things that are going to indulge in sins of the flesh. Like this is not an excuse for immodesty and it's True. not an excuse for like the uh, occulticness. But I think everybody involved in this conversation knows or should know that already. Yes, I 100% agree. And I think especially when people are so afraid of something, it's never for the reason they think they're afraid of it. You know, it's it's usually a, a reason that doesn't really have any foundation. And especially with Halloween, that's one of the main things is everyone's just so afraid of it. And I'm just like, okay, well, you guys stay in your little bunker. I'm going to go get candy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right. Like I, it's a good question to be like, okay, so what part of this specifically is immoral? You know, if the kids don't think it's pagan and asking for candy, isn't pagan. Like what, where does, where does it cross some kind of moral line? And if that moral line is something that is apparently innocuous, I think that should be a red flag. Yeah. You know, so if 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 you're saying like, well, they're doing a Ouija board. Okay, very clearly there's a line that's been crossed there. But if you're saying, oh, they put on a mask. Okay, like people put on masks. That's not. <laughs> and like that by itself isn't enough to be a, a moral problem. So let's find where the actual problem is. Because if, if there isn't one and you're just uneasy about the situation, then yeah, I think that's something that needs to be probed more deeply. But it doesn't doesn't seem to be something that we should be taking seriously as a reason not to do it i agree yeah oh where did he go <laughs> there he is <laughs> i'm so sorry i don't know uh ghost in the machine no you're fine i we've talked about this earlier technology issues are just a part of being catholic <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally true we were talking about this before yeah but um we have some questions now so actually that's the perfect catalyst okay, all right let's do it uh, let's see. What would be the best thing to do as a Catholic on Halloween day where I live? It's more looked at as a U.S. celebration. Yeah, I don't know where you live. Uh, if you're in a place where Halloween isn't a big thing, there's no obligation to do it. Like you don't have to try to make it a big thing. Um, so I think this answer is going to differ a little bit as to an American versus non-American. Like if you're in a place where there isn't a big culture of trick-or-treating or any of that stuff, those are fun traditions, but like you don't want to be like the one family like going door to door asking for candy while everyone's like, this is not America. We don't do that here. Get your own candy. Uh, you don't need to do that. So a good thing you could do uh, is just do something that kind of is fun and maybe celebrates the saints. Um, you can also just have like a fun evening with fall beverages, whatever that means. Like in the U.S., it's things like apple cider where it's like apple spice with cinnamon and some other stuff. Um, I know other places you have like mold wine and, and those kind of things, uh, wassail. I, obviously, uh, <laughs> you can overdo it with any alcoholic beverage. But the, the point there is you can celebrate just by having a fun and relaxing kind of fall time as we approach these two really important feast days between All Saints and All Souls Day. And that's a totally good and totally fine thing to do. Uh, some places, uh, I know here, but elsewhere, I know in Italy, this is as well, um, will do on the vigil. They'll have like a holy hour and then like a litany of the saints, that sort of thing, where that can be a really good way of kind of getting into the holiday. So that would be the 
answer I'd give for somebody who there isn't something like trick or treating, any of those things uh, kind of organically on the ground. Um, if on the other hand, you're in the U S and people are trick or treating and it's harmless, go join the fun. Like mm -hmm. don't be a wet blanket. And you know, like there are enough things you have to stick out from the crowd about there's enough things you have to be kind of like, ah, I can't go along with you on X, Y, Z. You don't need to find more things like that. It's true. Yeah. My husband and I, usually what we do is we make spike cider and we get apple cider donuts and then oh, we watch Coraline. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's the trifecta right there. Yeah. I didn't Sometimes even think about apple cider, but... Donuts, but <laughs> apple cider donuts are amazing. So. They're so good. It's hard to find good ones around here though. And Duncan probably has the best ones. So Oof. can't We've get got, We had a place until COVID time that no. was like an apple farm that made amazing apple cider donuts. Oh. And you'd get them warm and they were incredible. Oh my gosh. I, uh, it's I so sad donuts. when they get lost. That's <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> no, I love that. Um, okay. Somebody wants to know who your favorite saint is. Uh, I think I'm assuming that it's not going to count to choose like Mary or St. Joseph or any of the apostles or anybody. So if, if we're going post first century, <laughs> uh, St. Francis de Sales. He's awesome. Um, yes. I've been tremendously i've benefited tremendously from him uh i've found him to be a, a huge blessing in my life have you read any of his books or what specific yeah introduction to the devout life i really recommend and anyone who picks it up i would say this uh two things one there is in the first part of the book a series of like reflections that you can do and i think a lot of people tap out there because they think like oh i need to like set aside the next nine days to go through these reflections that can yep. be really good if you've got a bunch of time on your hands, but I would not let that um, get you down. I would, you know, read through them and then feel free to go back to them later, but then just keep reading the book because the book is so good. I've heard um, that you're supposed to read it in a specific order. You're supposed to like start in the middle and then go to the beginning. Well, he's got different parts for like where you are in the spiritual life. I just go cover to cover. And that's, that's what I recommend because technically it's written so the context is he's writing to this woman who is living in the secular realm. It's actually mm -hmm. very fitting. I didn't even plan it this way, but she's in, you know, the secular world, which obviously isn't as secular as it is today, yeah. but still there's things like balls and, you know, fancy dances and worldliness and all that stuff. And she's wondering like, okay, how can I be holy as a wife who's called to be in this space? Uh, if I'm not meant to like be a nun, Right. And so he's writing a very practical book uh, for the lay faithful living in the world. And he starts with those who are just beginning uh, on living a life of devotion, which is why it's called Introduction to the Devout Life. So part one is like, OK, I don't want to be lukewarm anymore. I want to go deeper. And it turned out there was way more stuff in there I needed to hear that I wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd at least be a part two -er. No, I had a lot of part one stuff I had to work on. And then uh, as, as you go on, there's, there's some stuff I want to say part, it's been too long since I've read it. I think part four is like a year later, basically, if, if you're coming okay. back to the book, what are some areas to kind of grow in? Because he doesn't want to give you too much kind of all at once. Um, I would say the first time you read it, I did, I would just read cover to cover, but it can be helpful to know that he doesn't expect you to solve every spiritual problem that you're going to realize you have. Right. Uh, immediately. And so maybe you find one part to focus on and you just stay there for a while. And I think that's totally all right as well. That's the nice thing about books is you can take your time with them. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> There's no rush. Well, I think that's all the questions we have uh, today. So thank you so much, Joe, for yeah, coming on and, and doing this with us. I really appreciate it. Maybe we'll have you back on in the future. Yeah, I'd love to come on. This was this was a real joy. Yeah, I'm so glad. And where can my listeners find you real quick? Oh, yeah. So I am a full-time apologist at Catholic Answers at Catholic.com. And I have a twice-weekly podcast called Shameless Popery. Uh, you can get it uh, on YouTube. It would look up Shameless Popery or wherever you listen, you know, Apple or Spotify or wherever. Uh, you can also go to shamelessjoe.com. I think that's my Patreon now, but I think it also might have links to all of the other stuff I do. 
Awesome. Yeah. And I'll link all that below in the description after Wonderful. this. Thank you. It'll work out well. Well, thank you so much again, yeah, Joe. I really pleasure. appreciate it. And with all that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed this and I will talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye.